Welcome to Fading Memories, a supportive podcast for those of us caring for a loved one with memory loss. I am excited to welcome Lola Franknoy today. She is the creator of Lola's Art Kits. They are art kits designed for people specifically with Alzheimer's. Lola is a caregiver and a creative, and I'm excited to learn more about her art kits. So join me in welcoming Lola. Thanks for coming on today. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. So you are an artist, but you are also a caregiver. And I love it how caregivers end up, many of us end up coming up with books and apps and all kinds of ways to help the journey of Alzheimer's. So why don't you tell me a little bit about you and your mom? Well, my mom is no longer with us, but I remember when words started to fail us in communication, I felt as an artist, I should be able to do something with her that was nonverbal. And I've been um, teaching art and being director of uh, programs for older adults for 30 years now. So I knew a little bit about the illness. I knew a little bit about how older people respond to art, which is a completely different generation on, you know, like your comment before we had the interview that they're afraid to mess up. I mean, that that's all part of the generation. So as much as it, as it is about the, the illness. So I came up with prompts rather than leaving blank pieces of paper. I came up with prompts such as um, enough information about a light bulb that they had to, to finish or a, or a dress. And I also came up with prompts with half of the page finished like a beautiful color kimono and the other half bland. So there was enough visual interest in the image, but also enough there so they didn't have to start from scratch. There was something already there for them to continue. And this eases the ten that tension of I, I, I don't know what to do. I'm not an artist, you know, all those classic responses that you get. And um, I started, uh, you know, looking around the house and just trying these things with her and then coming back and understanding that the, the kid had value not only for the people that had Alzheimer's, but also had value for caregivers because caregivers, as you know, we need a break some. Definitely. And this has this um, kind of built-in design of a self-starter so they can just continue the, this work. And um, there's enough variety in, in the art kit. It has clay and it has collages and it has prompts. So if one doesn't work one day, you can, you can try a, another exercise. And um, then of course, I, I live in San Francisco and there is USF is, is doing incredible work on Alzheimer's and creativity. And they have a, a center with a gallery and all that. And, all the new research is proving that the area of the brain where creativity lies remains intact until the final stages of, of the illness. So that's why I wanted to have an art kit that was ch that challenged, you know, um, the usual activities that people with Alzheimer's get is things for children, little puzzles and nothing. I mean, kind of in my, in my opinion, a little demeaning when the creativity is there. And so my kit is just kind of 
bring helps it bring it out. That makes sense. My mom was resistant to coloring with the basic, you know, coloring pages. And part of it, I think, was her visual processing was so bad that she had a very difficult time deciphering what was inside the lines and outside the lines. And, you know, that makes it, that makes it a challenge. And with your prompts, and I saw on the video, so you had like a, like a half light bulb outline yeah I mean, some people had at when they completed it it wasn't a light bulb it was other things i'm wondering if that would have been better for her although when i was attempting to do creative things with her as a way of engaging with her she was definitely much closer to the end of her life so that might have been why it was such a struggle i did not yes. ever try clay uh -huh. Mostly because she was in a memory care residence and carrying all that stuff around was kind of a challenge, but. Yeah, and the kit contains this little package of paper clay. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be, it's both, it's soft and it, it uh, dries, you know, naturally so you don't have to bake it or, or do anything. And And I have prompts for that too, so. I just don't let people kind of get frustrated. I try to uh, lessen the amount of frustration um, as much as possible. And there's people that in, in the group I was teaching at the Institute on Aging for a while, and there's people that would start with the art kit, kind of like uh, exercise would, and then would just want the... A piece of paper to kind of after the warm up to just be on their own and do abstractions, which are um, welcome. I mean, I would show lots of images of, of people doing abstraction, and that wasn't in their vocabulary. So it was like teaching a little bit of art history. <laughs> they had my permission to do abstractions and have it be valid, wonderful, expressive art. So that was what I tried to get my mom to do. But maybe, like I said, she was probably too far into the disease. And she also was a seamstress and she did woodworking and acrylic painting. No, she did oil painting too. That was back in the 70s. So we're going back a little ways. And I'm wondering if all of what she did was very precise. And that's why she... You know, it wasn't like, here's a pile of stuff, create something. It was like, follow these directions and, and have a, a dress. Or um, she, she liked to do the wood cutouts of like, I have a, a reindeer with a light bulb for a nose that we put out every Christmas time. And so that was the kind of thing. And you have to be a little bit precise when you're cutting wood and fabric. So I wonder if that was one of her issues. Now, I know <laughs> it... Yeah, we bring we bring our history, and she she had standards for herself, <laughs> and uh, it's it's hard to let go of those, you know. Uh, I believe that because everything I try, you know, I tried um, like leaf rubbings. Um, one person, one of one guest that I had suggested finger painting. Another person said that that was too childish and demeaning, like you said. And again, I didn't want to, I always went and visited her after a meeting. So I didn't want to like have to pack a huge bag of stuff to lug around. And then we, we always ended up going to the park and watching kids or in the, the not as great weather, we'd go to the library. I happen to be on the other side of the mountain from you. So I'm in the hot, hot part of the state. So uh -huh. um, I'm in Brentwood. So we're like 45 miles apart. So <laughs> I don't yeah. think I've talked to anybody in San Francisco for quite a while. So this is kind of a treat. Now, I, I know in the kits, you also have collages and I didn't, yeah. well, how do those work? Well, again, to, to give it, give uh, the caregiver an easier time. I have collage images already there. So People can, get, and I have a pair of uh, safe scissors. So it's basically cutting the images. And just from what you said, I have images of 
food, children, and uh, pets, you know. So, I mean, everyone loves those. So they could cut those, and there's a glue stick. And there's a choice there of where they want to place it on the paper and what they want next to it. So that's the beauty of collage, that it's very much in the moment and there's no skills required. And they can just play with the images and glue them. And then I always encourage them to use watercolor for the background. So it, it could grow into something different. And they really like that. And at the classes that I've taught and, and workshops, um, they also like looking into magazines and telling me which images they liked and they we would cut them and, and work with them. So things that are already made, that are already present in the world to, to start them with. And then once they're hooked with their creativity, it just kind of happens. I can see that. and I I was smiling because kids and pets, my mom had dogs all her life, except for the last year and a half. She, when she moved into the memory care residence, she actually had her black miniature poodle with her. So they were there together for about a year and a half until they renovated the entire community. And then Mrs. Ms. Uh, not too cooperative on, on going outside to do her business. She needed to be rehomed which the timing on that was pretty good because at that point she was more like a, like the handbag that my mom carted around all the time. It was just there. It wasn't, didn't have a purpose or a meaning. So I, I mentioned that cause I, I have three golden retrievers. I don't want people to think I just got rid of the dog. It was a diff, difficult decision for my sister and I, but I wondering, I was thinking if I had cut out the images for her, if that would have helped her, but I don't know. I think she was too, I think I attempted to do creative stuff with her too late in the, in the disease. I would, I would assume. Before, that, we, before we know, we go any further, I'm here to release you from the guilt of what <laughs> you couldn't do with your mom. It's now disappeared. You are free from it. <laughs> I tried. I mean, this is, this is the caregiver's guilt that we carry, you know, about what else we could have done. And it's very natural to feel that way, but did the best we could. That is true. And she loved going out and watching the kids in the park and, you know, sitting in the park. Sometimes I would read. Sometimes I'd answer emails on my phone. Nothing you know, wrong with that. Yeah, I was like, it, it, it worked. It wasn't the most exciting way to spend an afternoon, but, you know, made her happy and that was what was important. So the other, I know another part of your kit, you have like um, a section that's, it's got like prompts for writing, which really kind of blew me away because yeah. that was definitely beyond my mom at this point. <laughs> How does that I, work? Well, well, there's some uh, older people that are not visual artists and I can't uh, transform them <laughs> just because of my will. <laughs> so they're into writing. So I put some really non-linear uh, photographs of, of people in situations. Like there's some people having a drink in the office toasting something. And so it, people would get curious and then write what they thought was happening in, in these photographs. And um, they got to be, some of them got to be short stories and they started as, but it, it's again, it's giving them a prompt, giving them something that they can continue, that they can think about. And for a caregiver that has, um, mom waking up at three in the morning and wants to go back to sleep or needs to pay the bills or something, just to have them do a page of, of the art kit. And um, it, can, it can be very helpful. Now, how long did your mom have Alzheimer's? 
I think she had it for about six years. See, I haven't met too many people that got to walk the Alzheimer's journey for 20. Wow. I actually think my mom started showing signs of cognitive impairment in the summer of 1995, which put her at 52 and a half. But it was definitely an issue after the turn of the century, which sounds really strange. Yeah. We, had a, we had a business together and she would take orders from clients and not write down due dates or directions or anything useful to get it completed properly. And so it, we walked the journey long enough that I actually don't remember when her mind was good, which is really sad. So, you know, trying to start with her on creative stuff in 2017, my old dog just came in the room. If, in case anybody's hearing heavy breathing, it's the dog, <laughs> not me. Um, I started in 2017 with her trying to do some just really basic creative stuff that you can't screw up. I mean, yeah, you can make art that, I mean, you can screw up art but it might still look interesting. So that was, that was what I used to tell her is that she, you, know, you can't screw it up. Don't worry about it. Just have fun. And it made her really, really tense and anxious. So I didn't, I didn't continue pursuing much of that very often because obviously making her tense and stressed is not, not the end goal. No, no. Now was your mom creative uh, prior to, to her, to you, to you creating these art kits and introducing them to her? Um, well, she was an amazing cook. And I remember as the um, illness progressed, I would find her like making things, you know, baking things, using all the hand movements as if she was making, you know, her recipes, which she adored to bake and all kinds of things. So that kind of gave me a hint that there was something that needed to be explored. There was something there that I could, that I could bring out. And after coming back um, home, I just started developing all, all these activities. And so she had passed away before the art kit was finished mm -hmm. and sold. And it's really uh, interesting how it sells all over the world. I mean, it, um, and I look in the map of where these kits go. And sometimes there are like little towns in France. And I mean, that's just so wonderful that the, internet can can do that that can can spread the word definitely i wouldn't have a podcast if it wasn't for the internet and a fast internet connection <laughs> yes so if you don't mind if i can give the website so people can definitely and it will also be hot linked in the show notes oh good so the website is our time programs.com and it's A-R-T-T-I-M-E-S programs, all one word, dot com. All you have to do is scroll down in the show notes and you can click on it and you can go right to her page on that website. I already checked it out. It was, it's very affordable and for what you're getting and you're getting a lot of help and, and the um, supplies, which... I'm yeah. a creative person. I like to make greeting cards because I didn't want, I'm not good at painting. I'm also a photographer. I, I did, you can only have so many things hanging on the walls or so many quilts or so many whatever. And at the beginning of the pandemic, I decided that I would make cards for the residents where my mom lived. And it's kind of expanded into friends and the owner of the restaurant that my husband goes to like almost daily. She's like, Oh, I'll take some cards for the staff for Christmas. So <laughs> I, oh, what, what do you, what do you use to make your cards? Um, it, they're all like little die cuts and embossing folders and uh -huh. inks and 
um, what is that stuff? Glitter, you know, that stuff that gets everywhere. Yeah. And it's, what's really interesting is I like the quote that you had in your video is creativity is like chocolate to the brain. It's actually Dr. Gene Cohen's. I wrote yes, Dr. Gene Cohen was a doctor that spent all his life uh, investigating creativity and the brain. So I've read all of his books and I really recommend them. They're amazing. But I just love this quote that creativity is like chocolate uh, to the brain. Well, I agree because I like to have chocolate and then make cards. And I can spend the other day I was like, I must stop because I'm starving. <laughs> I need to go have dinner. I'd been doing it for hours and I just, I either listen to music or I listen to podcasts, which is kind of funny, but it's just, you can just lose yourself in it. And it's, it's about one of the only things that's kept me from going completely insane because I already worked from home. So it's like, yay, I, I don't get to go any place or my husband tell already. Me, go ahead. Tell me, a li- tell me a little bit about what you do with this podcast. I talk to wonderful people like you and share all kinds of information and support and inspiration to family caregivers. And I do also have listeners that are um, paid caregivers, or they, you know, they're what's the, you know, they're the activity director at a, a community. So this is definitely something that they should be interested in. And I'm always looking for options for what to do with your loved one. Cause that's actually how the podcast started is I would go visit my mom and she would say, so what have you been up to lately? And I would tell her, Oh, well, I just came from our rotary meeting. Now my dad was a Rotarian for 45 years. My husband and I are Rotarians. My paternal grandfather was a Rotarian. So that was something that had enough, historical context that she knew what I was talking about. And she, she'd say, Oh, you know, was your dad there? or Was Chuck there? She thought I was her best friend. So it was a little odd <laughs> to refer to my dad as Chuck, but that's what we did. And then she'd like literally in three or four minutes, she'd say, so what have you been up to lately? And I'd say, well, you know, this morning I went to the gym and then, you know, had some lunch. Oh, Okay. And then she'd ask me again. And after about the fifth time, I'd be like, oh, I've explained my entire day. And I had people tell me, well, you should just make stuff up. And that always felt wrong, which wouldn't have been. But, you know, this was my mom and I wanted to, you know, be respectful. But I learned that trying to be respectful actually caused more problems. (laughs) So I did deep dives on the Internet. I read books and did Google searches until literally my eyes were blurry and my brain was just like mush. And then I would try these different things that were suggested in the books or the internet or whatever. And when it was a spectacular failure, I thought, man, you know, people who are caring for their, their loved one at home, either their parent or spouse, they don't have time for all this, this insane research that I've been doing, especially when you don't come up with a decent answer. So one day I was driving to the gym and the podcast that I, I had, I had a 12 minute podcast was perfect for the amount of time I needed to get to the gym. And they were talking about starting a podcast. And I'm like, oh, I should go and check and see if there's one on Alzheimer's caregiving. And there was, this was in 20, the end of 2017. And I looked and there was one and I played a couple episodes, but it just didn't speak to me. You know, like I'm a tea drinker. I love the smell of coffee. Don't want it. There's, you know, so it was kind of that kind of thing. It's like, I can see how people would like the podcast, but it just didn't speak to me. So then I heard another podcast on how to start a podcast. I was like, oh, I can do that. <laughs> so that's what I did. And I have learned so much from talking to people like you. And I wish I had learned a lot of it much sooner. Cause as I said, my mom died at the end of March, 2020, but knowing what I've learned in the last two and a half, almost three years, it's, I want to keep sharing that with people because, yeah. you know, it's, you never know what works. I had a guest whose husband was very smart, not creative at all. And one day she just put pencils and crayons and other 
drawing implements in front of him and just blank paper. And he said, I what do you want me to draw? And she says, whatever makes you happy. And his very basic drawings are the illustrations in the book that she wrote after he passed away. So it, I know that would not have worked with my mom. Like, and you said the prompts work a lot better. So, you know, these are kind of my, my opinion is, you know, sometimes you just got to try things and find what doesn't work. Cause that's usually, <laughs> You usually find what doesn't work faster. And then... So if I may say, I mm -hmm. the stages of the illness affect people in different ways. Some people, when they actually just completely lose their memory, um, are free of that judgment and start really being more creative. I have found that on many people. Some people hold on to their identity till the very, very end. So, but then um, sometimes the illness has a way to changing people. My mom became funnier and softer with the illness as she, as it progressed. So there's difference, you know, within people and, and the stages of the, of Alzheimer's too. Yeah, well, everybody, everybody physically and mentally are different and the disease affects different parts of the brain. So it's, while Alzheimer's is very similar across the spectrum, it's also very different. Because my mom, the reason my mom passed away is she was fighting with the caregivers and fell and broke her leg and died in two and a half weeks. So we hear that, you know, oh, Aunt Betty was really healthy until she fell and broke her hip and then she died in two weeks. That was kind of what happened with my mom because she was still extremely verbal. None of what she said made sense. And this is one of the, one of the things where I learned things that don't work and why trying to be respectful always backfired on me is she would, she would speak a sentence and it was all very clear words, but they didn't, there was no grammatical context or historical context. And I always thought it was, proper, respectful, whatever you want to call it, to try to figure out what she was telling me so that I could respond with something other than, oh yeah, okay, that sounds interesting, or oh yeah, mm, yeah, that's a good idea, or whatever, some generic blah, blah, blah. And if I scrunched up my face and tried to like get in her mind, she would immediately get angry. So I had to learn really quick not to ever do that. I just started way too late in the game, but then I would just, like there was a day she told me, that her brothers were normal people now. And I went, oh, I'm so glad to hear your brothers are normal people now. <laughs> That's a yes, really good exactly. thing. <laughs> I, I, mean, I, I learned that lesson too. It's like, I'm going to be where you are all the way. And mm -hmm. I'm going to support whatever fiction or nonfiction you're at. And I'm, we're going to communicate the best way we can without judgment. My mom, my mom hung on to so upset. I would get upset when she lost her train of thought at the beginning. Mm. And that was bad for me. You know, it, it created a deep sorrow and, and anxiety. And I mean, the purpose was to be together and communicate as well as we could. And she was in charge. I felt. <laughs> That's, that's interesting. So my mom always hung on to being a caregiver herself. She walked up until the day she broke her leg. So she walked, she talked. I mean, a lot of people did not fully understand how advanced her Alzheimer's was, including me to a point. And I feared that she would literally just walk and mumble for years. So I don't know if falling and breaking her leg was a blessing for all of us. It was a little bit of a shock that she, she went on us, but considering everything that's happened in 2020, I think she might've had a little clarity and she could see in the future. And she's like, never mind, I'm not interested. Oh, gosh, yes. It's been so hard on older adults uh, with, the, with COVID and having that extra stress where she couldn't eat with other people or have to be in her room the whole time. Yeah, she was in her room because she was, they couldn't, they didn't, you know, it's bad when the surgeons don't want to do surgery. So she was bed bound 
And she'd already started having trouble eating. And a lot of it was, I don't think she recognized food as food. It was really strange. But she always wanted to help the other residents, the ones that were on walkers or, you know, she would pop her head out the door and say, well, if there's anything you need, just let me know. And I had the hardest time not snickering when she'd say that because I was like, you can't help that woman. <laughs> You can hardly help yourself. So that was who my mom was, but she got very aggressive at the end, mm -hmm. which was very difficult. But I'm glad that I didn't, you know, between COVID and our incredibly hot two couple of weeks and then the fires we had with the really horrific air quality. I don't think I've ever seen air quality that bad where we live in my entire life, you know, I'm just, I'm really glad that I didn't have to try to figure out what to do with mom Yeah. this year, you know, not being able to go and watch kids at the pool, which I know sounds a little creepy <laughs> or the park. She liked it hot. So we could go sit in the park when it was a hundred degrees and I'd be dying and she'd be, she'd be really happy. Mm -hmm. And she, she loved to watch kids. So that was, that was her thing. And I was fine with it, but I, I had, earlier on wished for a little bit more interaction, a little bit more engagement, but I think that that was, I think I was too late to try to introduce that. But, and that's kind of what I'm trying to share with the podcast is let people know where I was at, what I was trying to do and why it did or didn't work so that maybe, you know, they can save themselves some frustrations or they can say, Oh, it didn't work for her because she waited too long. But, you know, my um, mom is mid stages or whatever. And, you know. Or you may, be, you may be talking and echoing someone's own experience exactly. And just hearing someone else that went through the same experience is very helpful. I hope so. That's the whole point. This is a yes. labor of love. I spent a lot of time working on this. It's also kept me sane. Fortunately, I don't need the money because... I'm not making money podcasting yet, but that's okay. Cause it's, I love talking to people like you and sharing what I, what I've learned. And there well, are days. Thank you. thank you for doing what you do. It's Oh, important. you're welcome. And um, so this, you, you touched on it really quick and I didn't get a chance to ask is the art gallery at that you were talking about for the older people. Is that always at UCSF or is it? Yes. I, uh, if you if you just type UCSF Alzheimer's Center and they have this thing where they have artists in residence work with um, subjects about Alzheimer's and mental illness. They have a gallery and most important, they do all the research on creativity and the brain. And I find fascinating and I'm um, you know they have lectures that you can be part of so yeah look into that well since it's not terribly far although getting to UCSF from where I live is not easy because you actually have to drive taking but right now they're having zoom lectures and stuff so you can oh, that's really cool so yeah. I'm I'm going to send you an email with the link for that That'd be great because I'm very interested in creativity in the brain because... And, and the person in charge of that whole world of creativity and the brain, his name is Bruce Miller. And he's a very important person in the Alzheimer research world. Cool. Well, I would definitely check into that. <laughs> I do so many things on Zoom, Zoom town halls with... Uh, representatives and my whole life is on zoom these days <laughs> if I'm not walking yeah. the dogs or making cards I'm probably on the computer <laughs> yes I called my husband a zombie yeah that's a good I like that I, I joke because I've been on zoom for a little over two years and I used to have to explain how to log on even though it's very simple many of my guests are in their 70s and 80s so one of them referred to herself as a tech Klutz, which I love. And she, we had a challenge, but she got it solved. That was great.
But there are times when I've logged into Zoom, I actually had to have one guest turn off his video because the, you know, there were so many people Zooming, I guess, at that point in the daytime that it just, when his video was on, it just broke up. It was like I was talking to somebody on Mars. And as soon as he turned the video off, the audio was fine. So the other thing that I'm doing right now is I'm creating mini art kits. So when people pick up their, their, I mean, the senior centers are still closed here, but they're still driving to get their lunches. Mm -hmm. When they pick up their lunch, they also pick up a mini art kit so they can work at home, whether okay. it's a loved one or themselves driving, they, they get that with their meal. That's a fantastic idea. Even for, even when the senior centers reopen, that's not a bad idea for people just because, you know, there's a lot of hours in the week. <laughs> yes. Especially at night. Yes. Yeah. I didn't have to deal with that with my mom, but closer to the end, she started getting up at like two or three o'clock in the morning and that's really not her. So she and I were very similar, you know, like, good, well, fall asleep in front of the TV, then stagger to bed, and then sleep till 7 o'clock. Yeah. But, you know, with the requisite getting up to use the restroom in the middle of the night. Yeah. So it was, you know, I wished I could have helped her be her creative self earlier on in life, but my dad was not interested in assistance or her going to an adult day program where that might have been encouraged so remember i released you from that yes 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 i don't have i know i did the best i could i still it's just there's you know we always wish we could have done just a little bit more oh yes this is the caregiver thing yep just you just feel that way and it's out of love it's out of love that is true so is there any, um, do you have like a quick tip on how to get people started despite the kit? I mean, when, when, uh, they get, blah, when they get the kit, there we go. I'm trying uh -huh. to get the dog. For, <laughs> dog is panting. Well, when they get the kit, the kit comes with instructions, which is very simple. And then each activity comes also with instruction on how to get started, what to do. And, um, Sometimes it's, it's hard to have the caregiver not play such an important role. I mean, they just want to do it for mom or something. And that's always a challenge for me because I know it comes from a good place, but I want mom to explore her creativity without so much assistance and, and judgment from, you know, whoever is sitting next to them. So, um, it's a fine line. I mean, you want to encourage, and I, I always want daughters and sons to be part of it, but not to get too intrusive in, in the great right. part. <laughs> well, I appreciate this chat this afternoon. So does my furry friend down here that is off camera, but I'm sure the people listening can hear him. because I he can loves hear him. him. Yeah, he loves his mama. He wanted to be with me, so he came up the stairs. He's almost 13, so he's an old guy. But he's he's a healthy old guy. But the stairs are hard for him. Mm -hmm. I, I do joke on my social media. And sometimes if you listen really closely, you can hear either snoring or heavy breathing in the background of podcasts. And it's always him. So Well, keep me keep me informed about future podcast you're having and i'll tune in there every tuesday wherever you listen to podcasts do you listen to any at all right now uh yes okay so on apple spotify there's like i don't know so many places to listen yes i i can do that okay um and if you go in the email you can go to my website it also takes you to the different links for each specific show. And I will definitely let you know when yours is coming out. I think it's either late November, early December. I forgot to bring the clipboard over here with the list on it. 
But this has been a lot of fun and it's thank you so much. I'm definitely gonna check out the creativity and the brain research because obviously that's that's right up my yeah. alley. <laughs> I mean get Dean Cohen's books. You would love his books. I will check into that too. Is it C O W E N or is there an H in there? As C O H E N. Okay. Perfect. Awesome. Well, I appreciate this tremendously today. Me too. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And I will let you know if anything exciting is happening. <laughs> All right. Good luck. Stay safe. You too. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.